Educational Communications and this station present Environmental Directions with Nancy Perlman. On this series, we explore the effects of human influence on the Earth's ecosystems and discuss solutions to environmental problems which affect the quality of life on this planet. Environmental Directions gives you the kind of information you need to help you participate in decisions impacting your community, the nation, and the world. Now, here's your host, Nancy Perlman. Hello. For the next half hour, we are going to be talking about preserving historic buildings, actually saving mid-century modern houses across America. With my guest, George Smart. He is CEO and founder of U.S. Modernist Dot org, host of U.S. Modernist Radio, and is an honorary member of the American Institute of Architects. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Hi, Nancy. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. I am thrilled that you care about mid-century modern houses. In fact, your intrepid team of nonprofit staff and volunteers have documented over 120 major 20th century architects and over 20,000 modernist houses, and you've scanned in your U.S. modernist library over 4.1 million pages of architecture magazines going back over 130 years. That is quite a task to do that kind of documentation. How easy was it? Oh, my gosh. I am so tired. It's been a real blast all the way. A lot of fun. Uh, very rewarding to have a great team of people, both staff and volunteers that we work with. And our volunteers are all around the country. Contributors from the individual level all the way up to the Smithsonian have donated to our library project. We are doing about a 1,000 pages a day of scanning, sometimes more. Every single day, we're adding some content to the website so that owners, researchers, architects, sellers, professors, builders, anybody who has an interest in finding out about these houses can and can do so easily. How do you decide which architects to include and what houses to include? Well, we really are just deciding on architects, because once we decide on architect, we document every house they've ever done, built, unbuilt, modern, non-modern, and sometimes that's a lot. For instance, Frank Lloyd Wright did about 500. I think Lautner did about 400. Neutra did probably 450, 475, but they were exceptions. Most architects during that time were not as famous as Lautner and Wright and, and Neutra, they were in towns like San Bernardino and St. Louis and Fayetteville, North Carolina and Albany, New York. And maybe in their entire careers, they just did three or four houses. We're now getting to that level. We started with the most famous architects and I'm working down to the less famous architects. And of course, along the way, people contribute all kinds of things, send us information on houses. We're doing all this for a reason. And the reason is so we want to prevent as many of these houses from being destroyed as possible. And you can't save something unless you know where it is and why it's important. That is a major problem, though, because these houses being mid-century, we're talking about the 1940s, 50s, 60s, aren't considered too old. And yet they are historic. But we think of historic buildings as hundreds of years old. And you go back to Europe, they're literally hundreds and thousands of years old. So how do you view a mid-century modern building as being unique and special. How does it differ from the other kind of buildings of that period? Technically, for a house to be historic, it only has to be 50 years old. So that's 1973. The issue with modernist houses particularly is they don't look old. They don't look like a Victorian house, for example, or something kind of, you know, Greco-Roman from way back. They look sometimes almost new. They look like the future. And that's why it's so difficult for historical review boards and others to want to declare them as historical or give them special status. They don't have that ancient look about them. That's why they're modern. They're actually right. sort of advanced in terms of design. Exactly. Do these homes have special ecological or sustainable features, or is it literally just the design of the building and the location of the building and the building fitting into nature or being with nature? Modernist design was ahead of the times. I mean, they were doing solar studies before that was even a thing. And the solar study is basically figuring out on a piece of land, how do you situate the house so that when the sun goes over it, 
it goes over in the most beneficial way. For instance, to get most of the light in on the southern side so that you get more of that direct heat in the winter and you can angle it so that in the summer it's not beaming in as brightly, things like that. In the early days, 30s and 40s, even into the 50s, houses were designed, even in warm climates, to not have air conditioning. They had a lot of open, operable windows and other kinds of features to bring the outside in. And of course, that doesn't take a lot of energy just to open a window like it does to run an air conditioner. So there's that. You know, at the time, there really weren't many synthetics coming along for building materials. It was just wood, primarily concrete, glass, and steel. It was fairly basic construction, and the size of the houses was also small in compared to today's standards. So you're looking at houses anywhere from 1,000 square feet to maybe 2,000, 2,500, where in Los Angeles today, they're building houses routinely that are between like 10 and 30,000 square feet. The square footage makes a big difference in terms of livable space, and yet at the same time, you want to maintain a natural environment around the buildings. How many of these are right in the downtown areas of cities or in the suburbs without natural areas? And how many are in wilder places, forests, deserts, so forth? Most of the modernist houses are not in super urban settings. They have some amount of land around them or some sort of planned landscape design around them in the different hills of LA and the Silver Lake area where there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of modernist houses. You may not be in a huge lot, but you can tell that some care was taken to how the landscape design was done and how the house is slotted in to a piece of property or into a hillside. Around the rest of the country, most modernist houses were built on a fair amount of acreage, maybe one to four acres in a lot of cases because they were often second homes for people, particularly in the Northeast and in Florida. People wanted to go down there and be able to relax and get away and not have neighbors close by. You're focusing on mid-century modern houses that have unique designs and look, but how many of these architects built public buildings? How many public buildings are mid-century modern that are special and interesting to be in and look at? There are a lot of them. I mean, that's how, to be honest, most architects made their money. It's difficult to run a profitable practice doing houses. You have to be doing churches and schools and museums and airports and hospitals and offices and things like that to meet most of the payroll. Designing houses, except in a few cases where you had really rich clients, was a case where uh, it was a labor of love for most architects at that scale, and still is. We still find that some of the even biggest name architects in the world, you'll see they sneak in a house every now and then that gets built because they just love doing it, and they love doing it on that scale. It's definitely a different scale. Many of these architects from the last half of last century were influenced by the modern architecture of the first half of last century by people like Frank Lloyd Wright, and some of them actually studied at his school in Arizona. Do most of these architects attribute their work to the previous architects? Well, it depends. I mean, Frank Lloyd Wright, still today, is the only architect most Americans can name. It's amazing. In this profession, there's really only been one person that stood out in all this time. And so architects generally have studied right at some point during their educational career, from young architects to older architects. Although not everyone is influenced by him, they're often influenced by the principles that are the bedrock, really, of modernism. And one of those principles is bringing the outdoors in, Another principle is trying to use materials more intelligently to create spaces that are more relaxing and have a better vibe, so to speak, than traditional construction. Nowadays, there's much more attention on using both materials and construction processes that are helpful to the environment and not contributing to climate change. Frank Lloyd Wright was into all of that to some aspect or another, but it's come a long way since his day and since he died now in 1959.
I have traveled to many different countries and seen some beautiful modern architecture, whether or not it's in Venezuela and South America or in the Caucasus Mountains in Baku, Azerbaijan. And how many of these foreign architects are influenced by the mid-century modern architects of the United States, or do they have their own school of architecture? They're definitely influenced by U.S. architecture, but also they're influenced by Europe, I think, to a large extent. The work of Le Corbusier, later on of Jean Nouvel, architects in the U.K., Norman Foster, for instance, they're closer to some of those places that you mentioned. London and Paris are also kind of the leading hubs for architecture for both Europe and North Africa and even part of the Middle East. It's really interesting to see when local traditional designs are also incorporated into modern architecture, regardless of where it is. That's right. I mean, you always want your building to have some kind of relationship to its site and to the people that are there, to the adjacent buildings. That's been kind of the prime directive of architecture for a long time. And every prime directive has its opposite. You have people like Zaha Hadid, who would make buildings that look nothing like their neighbors and had never been done before anyway, just stood out as completely original. And they are loved, too, in their environments. There's a problem maintaining these historic unique architectural structures because it's costly. Sometimes new construction people, repair people don't know how to do it in the old style. So how do we encourage owners to preserve and protect them in their original condition? One of the few things that is great about social media and Facebook is there are lots of special interest groups that are out there. If you own a right house, for instance, there are a lot of right owner groups that you can join, where you can share information about people who have these skills, or places that you can get certain materials, or how to turn your house into a Airbnb if you are so inclined, or any of those things that an owner might be curious about but not have the resources close at hand. And, of course, they can always tune in to your podcast, U.S. Modernist Radio, and share information and hear about other projects. And we'll talk more about mid-century modern houses with my guest, George Smart, when we return in a moment. Environmental Directions with Nancy Perlman continues with further discussion of the world's critical ecological issues. For more information, you may call 310 559 9160 or go to www.ecoprojects.org. Now, here's Nancy. I'm speaking with George Smart, who is the CEO and founder of usmodernist.org. One of your major concerns is the fact that, unfortunately, bulldozers are continuing to destroy mid-century modernist houses by famous architects. You consider these livable works of art, and yet they're threatened by rising land prices and disinterested heirs. So unless they have some sort of legal protection, which I think most of them don't, they can be bulldozed. I heard that even a Frank Lloyd Wright house was recently bulldozed. It happens a lot. It really does. And to explain the, the timeline of this, everything was going along fine with modernism until about 1972. And that, that was the point at which some of these houses developed some problems. They had leaky roofs, for instance. And so the real estate community started spreading the word that you should never buy a flat roof house because it was going to leak. And so interest just plummeted both in buying these older houses and also building new modernist houses. Fast forward about 25 years to 1995, and people are interested again. Some very important renovations like the Kaufman House in Palm Springs got finished and showed that these houses could be really magnificently restored. And now coming all the way forward, it's been an explosion of interest in mid-century modern. And our site, as well as others, are helping essentially market these houses and give them the publicity they need because most realtors are not familiar 
with modernist houses. They don't know how to sell them. They don't know how to describe them. Sometimes they get the information completely wrong. I've seen any number of houses described as designed by Frank Lloyd Wright that absolutely were not. There was a Paul Rudolph house in the Northeast with a helipad and awful teal shingles on it. It was advertised as a genuine Paul Rudolph. Not true. Part of what we do is help spread the word about what houses are available through our newsletter. It's free and people can subscribe to, and also by letting people know what their options are to preserve a house as an owner. The only thing that really has any legal enforcement power in almost every jurisdiction in the United States is something called the preservation easement. Please explain that to the public. So the preservation easement is essentially a homeowner's association for one house. You go to an attorney, they drop the papers, It is a set of rules that guide the policy of your house. And what a preservation easement says generally is that if a house is going to be modified, like added onto, it has to be done in the same architectural style as the original. It says if the house suffers a major natural disaster, like a hurricane, earthquake, something else like that, that it cannot be destroyed unless a certain percentage of it is totaled, totaled, wiped out. These documents ride with the deed in whatever county you are in, and they are legally enforceable. If somebody comes along, buys the house, and violates them, they can be taken to court. A lot of people think that other protections have enforcement power, and they don't. Like, for instance, if your house is on the National Register of Historic Places, that means nothing. It does not protect your house at all. If you have won local designation as a historic site, meaningless. If you have a house by a famous architect or a famous builder or somebody famous slept in your house one night or any of those kind of things, it does nothing to protect the house. Only a preservation easement can do that. Now, in a few jurisdictions, you can delay the bulldozing of a house for maybe six months, sometimes a year, if people petition to get it together. But after that, there's zero you can do to stop it. And we've lost a lot of them around the country. We lost the Marcel Breuer house in 2022, which is now a tennis court. Where? It's very sad. This is in New York. The preservation easement is important to have if the current owner wants to make sure that the house isn't destroyed. Absolutely. They could do that for future owners. Forever. It rides on the deed forever. To get more information, your newsletter, they can go to your website, usmodernist.org. Yes. And then they can probably see that list of over 120 Architects, you mentioned just a few that are very famous, but how does one become famous as a mid-century modern architect, particularly since most of the smaller towns and cities haven't even documented what they have in their cities? Well, back in the day, the way that you got famous as an architect was you got published in the print magazines which were in existence at the time. And there were about a dozen, roughly, that people sought to get into. That's how you got known. And then, of course, it's great if the New York Times or the Washington Post picked up the story about you or the house or your client or something else like that. It's changed, of course. Print magazines are much fewer these days. Newspapers are being run out of business, and lots of things are digital. And instead of 12 major places you could promote yourself, they're probably... 120,000 for an architect now. If you're an architect in a small to medium town and you want to do more modern work, I tell architects all the time, you just have to go where the clients are. You have to find out, you know, where the people in town that like this kind of stuff. One easy thing to do is for the architects to join the local art museum because many people who like architecture also like art and many people who commission modernist houses also have art. And that's the place to get clients for modernist houses. Are you able to obtain the actual architectural blueprints? Because I know that with my historic cabin designed by John Lautner, the draft blueprints were different than the final blueprint, the way it was actually built. It's important to have those kinds of documents not destroyed. Right. We don't handle blueprints as an organization. We do receive them a lot. And then what we do is we pass them on to 
whatever institution is holding the architect's records. And if there's not an institution, we try to coordinate between the family of the architect and usually where that architect went to school to create an archive and their special collections. You have in your digital files over 20,000 modernist houses. Is there any kind of estimate how many modernist houses there are, and from what year to what year is considered a modernist house? So we consider modernism to be a style, not a time period. So basically anything in America from about 1930 on forward that looks like a modernist house probably is, because there's so few of them relative to the rest of the housing stock. We estimate that 99.75% of the housing in the U.S. is not modernist. That only leaves one-fourth of one percent. And what makes that small fraction different? What are the outstanding features in a modernist house? Well, basically, modernist houses have four characteristics. They have a flat or a low-pitched roof, generally. They have an unusual amount of openings, windows, atriums, courtyards, doorways, sliding glass doors, anything that brings the outside in. They typically have an unusual geometry. It's not just a box with a pitched roof on top. And then finally, they have typically an open floor plan, which almost every house has now today that's being built. But back in the day, in the 50s, it was a radical new innovation because previous to that, most houses were built with smaller rooms that could be separated off with doors because in the winter, you didn't want to have to heat everything. You have won over 18 honors for leadership and preservation, including the National American Institute of Architects Honors for Collaborative and Professional Achievement. So even though you're not an architect, you have worked for 30 years as a management and strategy consultant. You work with people designing and building buildings. How many current architects are making new modernist houses? A surprising number are getting into it. The bigger the firm you go, the less likely they are to be doing houses. They're doing apartments and condos and bigger projects because that's what it takes to pay the bills for a big firm. But in any town of any size, say over 200,000, there's going to be a couple of practices that are small one to five person firms that are designing modernist houses. In the last 20 years, there's been also a shift to design build firms. So they're not only going to design it for you, they're going to build it for you as well. And that is a great option for most people considering a new modernist house. For one thing, you'll never have to worry about your architect and your contractor having an argument because they're the same person. That certainly helps in terms of getting the job done right. Right, exactly. When we look at architecture, there are different periods. We're talking about modernist architecture, but we've had in the past so many other kinds of architecture, particularly in Europe, going back to Gothic styles and to the oh, sure. Greek styles. How many styles of architecture are there, and when does what's considered modernistic architecture become something else? And are we going to change the name? Right now, modernism is still booming. People love to commission modernist houses. They collect modernist furniture. They're putting more and more contemporary art in their homes. I have a suspicion that as AI, artificial intelligence, takes over more and more of our processes, that we're going to see a shift towards some AI kind of designed homes. And that will be really interesting to see what they come up with in that, whether it's better or worse or different or whatever. It's going to be very intriguing. What needs to be done to save these unique houses? Do we need better laws? Not everybody's going to have an historic preservation easement. No, but that really is the key. Again, because it's really the only legally enforceable instrument for most non-urban areas. It's just a matter of educating the public and these owners about the preservation easement and getting them to take that step before they pass away or before they leave it to heirs who are often very disinterested and just want to sell the property to whoever and move on. When you look at all the houses in your collection, what stands out to you the most? I think it's really the enjoyment of the families. I get a lot of calls and conversations with sons, daughters, grandsons, granddaughters of both the architects 
and the people who commission the architects of these houses. And almost to a person, they tell these wonderful stories of growing up in the house, owning the house, of living there 20, 30, 40 years, about what a difference it made in their lives, about how it influenced their choices of careers often, into the arts, into architecture, into painting. Steve Jobs, for instance, grew up in an Eichler house. Eichler in California commissioned and built any number of very small, modest, modernist houses throughout California. So it's really my favorite part is connecting with the people behind these houses and hearing their stories. Thank you so much for sharing some of those stories with us. For modern houses, do they consider the location, the climate? Are they different, whether or not it's in the desert, the forest, a rainy area? There really is no difference. It's more a matter of materials. For instance, John Lautner designed a house in Alaska that's still there, and they just had to make it with more durable materials. We don't have time to learn about the thousands of homes by over a hundred modern architects. But who are some of these people? Where are the houses? Are they open to the public? Can people go see them? And what makes them so special to you? Oh, sure. Well, there are clusters of modernist houses in certain places in the country. In New Canaan, Connecticut, in the New York area, houses by Marcel Breuer, Jim Evans, Landis Gorris, John Johansson, Elliot Noyes, Philip Johnson, in Palm Springs, California, you have houses by John Porter Clark, William Cody, John Lautner, Hugh Kapner, Bill Kreisel, Don Wexler, Walter White, Stuart Williams. In Sarasota, you have houses by Carl Abbott, Jean Leedy, Victor Lundy, Guy Peterson, Paul Rudolph, Tim Siebert. In Long Island, out in the Hamptons, you've got houses by Harry Bates and Ulrich Franzen. Some of these places actually honor their modernist traditions, like Palm Springs every February has Modernism Week. Yes, and more of these areas are having their own weekend or week-long festival. Sarasota has one every year in November. New Canaan has one every two years, also in November. Denver has one. Phoenix has one. Uh, if people subscribe to our newsletter at usmarnest.org, we try to list all those upcoming events. You are doing documentation of mid-century modern houses. Since most of them belong to private owners, how many are open to the public? There are quite a few house museums now that are open all the time. To the public. When we know about those, we will note that in our archives under particular house entry. And then in most mid to large communities, there are modernist house tours every year or so where people open up their homes for half a day or a day and you can go inside and see what's in there. In our area, twice a year, we do a modernist house tour called Matapalooza, where we open up eight houses in a day and people can tour them. I wish I could join the tours. You've digitized over 130 years of architectural magazines. Mm -hmm. What changes have you seen in architecture from the beginning of that publication to the present? Well, one big change is that in the beginning, architecture magazines just catered to architects. The magazines were often full of jargon and technical terms, and they began to realize that the public wanted to see these things, and they wanted to see photos, lots of great photos of the work, and not so much jargon, and certainly not so much technical description. So today, you really have two leading magazines, one very much oriented to the public, and that's Architectural Digest. And then you have the venerable Architectural Record, which is more oriented towards architects, Although it has changed to a slightly more public focus in the last 40 years. Between those two, it's still quite an accomplishment for an architect to get their house published in one of those magazines. Do you have a favorite modernist architect or building? Well, one of my very favorite houses is the Albert Frey II house in Palm Springs. It's up on the side of a mountain above the Palm Springs Museum of Art. It has this incredible view of all of the valley across the airport, and it's only about 800 square feet. I'm just partial to smaller houses that are in that range, anywhere up to about maybe 1,800 square feet, because when you have a smaller footprint, the architect has to be even that more talented to make everything work just so. You really see some of the skill in the architects from these smaller houses.
Thank you for preserving this information in your archives. Thank you for being my guest. Oh, thank you. This is my pleasure. I have been speaking with George Smart, who is CEO and founder of usmodernist.org. I'm Nancy Perlman. Thank you very much for joining us, and do tune in again next week. If you would like free information about these environmental issues, go to www.ecoprojects.org or call 310-559-9160. Environmental Directions with your host, Nancy Perlman, is a community affairs program of the nonprofit organization Educational Communications and this station.